Welcome to our tribute to legends on our channel. Today we remember the amazing actors who passed away on this day, July 26, 2024. Let's honor their incredible work in the world of movies. We send our thoughts to their families and fans as we remember them. May their legacies inspire us forever. Before we start, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for more tributes. Bill Arthur Sky Sports has just shared the heartbreaking news that Bill Arthur, the legendary rugby league commentator, passed away at the age of 68 after a courageous 13-year battle with prostate cancer. Bill, a beloved figure in the world of rugby league, first received his diagnosis in 2011 and fought bravely ever since. Bill Arthur was the voice of rugby league on Sky Sports, taking on the role of lead commentator in 2019. His passion for the sport and dedication to his work made him a staple of Sky's coverage for over three decades. Sadly, Bill passed away peacefully on Wednesday morning, surrounded by his family. Bill is survived by his wife Cherry and their children Simon, Meredith, Kit, and Nancy. In a touching statement, Sky Sports Managing Director, Jonathan Licht, expressed the deep sorrow felt by the Sky family. He said, We are truly saddened by the loss of our friend and colleague Bill Arthur. Bill has been a mainstay of Sky Sports Rugby League coverage for the last 30 years. I want to express my personal gratitude to Bill for his unwavering commitment to Sky, as well as the passion and devotion he brought to our viewers and fans of the sport. I know that Bill will be greatly missed by those who were lucky enough to work with him, and I would like to extend my condolences to Bill's wife, Cherry, and his family for their loss. Eddie Hemmings, who Bill succeeded as the lead rugby league commentator, also paid tribute to his friend and colleague. Eddie reflected on Bill's remarkable career and the effortless way he stepped into his leading role. He particularly remembered Bill's brilliant commentary during the dramatic St. Helens last-minute try that clinched the grand final against Wigan in an empty stadium right after the COVID pandemic hit. Eddie described Bill as an inspiration to him and many others battling prostate cancer. Bill Arthur's voice and presence in the rugby league community will be sorely missed. His legacy, however, will continue to resonate with all who admired his work and his fighting spirit. Martin Indyk Martin Indyk, a renowned diplomat and influential figure in Middle East peace efforts, has passed away at the age of 73. This news comes from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, a think tank he helped establish. Indyk's career was marked by his two tenures as the United States Ambassador to Israel during the Clinton administration. He first held the position from 1995 to 1997 and again from 2000 to 2001. In between those terms, from 1997 to 2000, he served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Later, under President Obama, he was the U.S. Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations from 2013 to 2014. Born in Britain in 1951 and raised in Australia, Indyk's academic journey began with a bachelor's degree in economics from Sydney University and a doctorate from the Australian National University. He moved to the U.S. In 1982, taking up roles as a visiting professor and fellow at Columbia University. By 1993, he had become a U.S. citizen. Indyk played a crucial role as the top Middle East policy advisor on Clinton's National Security Council, deeply involved in the 2000 peace efforts between Israelis and Palestinians. He later penned Innocent Abroad an intimate account of American peace diplomacy in the Middle East, reflecting on these experiences. After resigning as Middle East peace envoy in 2014, following the collapse of the Israeli-Palestinian talks, Indyk transitioned back into policy analysis. Secretary of State John Kerry praised him as an indefatigable diplomat dedicated to peace. In his later years, Indy continued to be a leading scholar on Middle East policy at the Brookings Institution and the Council on Foreign Relations. He also authored Master of the Game Henry Kissinger and The Art of Middle East Diplomacy published in 2021. Martin Indyk's legacy as a tireless advocate for peace and a respected scholar will be remembered by many. Leo Burke it is with heavy hearts that we report the passing of Canadian wrestling legend Leo Burke, who has died at the age of 76. Known to his family as Leon's Cormier, Burke passed away on Wednesday afternoon in a Calgary nursing home, surrounded by loved ones. His son, Travis Cormier, 
shared the sad news with Global News. Hailing from Dorchester, New Brunswick, Burke began his wrestling career in 1966, joining his three brothers in the ring. Interestingly, none of them wrestled under their real name. Yvonne Cormier became the Beast, Jean Lewis was known as Rudy Kay, and Romeo took on the name Bobby Kay. But it was Leo Lance, wrestling as Leo Burke, who enjoyed the most storied career. Burke's wrestling journey took him around the globe with stints in Puerto Rico, Japan, and across the U.S. and Canada. However, his star shone brightest in Atlantic Canada and Alberta. Fellow wrestler Ron Hutchison, who shared the ring with Burke in the 1980s, reminisced about performing to packed houses in the Maritimes, drawing crowds of up to 6,000 every week at the Halifax Forum. In those days, wrestling was a major form of entertainment in Atlantic Canada. With limited TV channels, everyone tuned in, and Leo Burke became a household name, a true rock star. Travis Cormier fondly recalled how his father couldn't walk through a shopping mall without being mobbed by fans. Instead, they'd spend time together in nature, away from the public eye. Burke's career saw him wrestling against some of the biggest names in the sport, including Bret Hart, the British Bulldogs, and Harley Race. Despite his many battles, Burke rarely lost, particularly in his beloved Atlantic Canada. As Hutchison put it, by the end of the summer tour, Leo would inevitably reclaim his championship title. After hanging up his tights, Burke dedicated himself to training the next generation of wrestling stars, including Mark Henry and Ken Shamrock. His reputation was such that WWE owner Vince McMahon would send potential recruits to Calgary for approval by Burke and Bret Hart. If they got the nod, they'd make it to the WWE roster. Since his passing, tributes have been pouring in from around the world. The outpouring of support has been overwhelming, reflecting the immense impact Burke had on the wrestling community and his fans. Leo Burke's legacy will live on through the countless lives he touched, both in and out of the ring. He was truly a hero in Atlantic Canada, a beloved figure whose memory will be cherished by many. Charlies Theron Rumors are circulating about the supposed death of Charlies Theron, but these reports are entirely false. Charlies Theron is alive and well. This misinformation seems to be part of an unfortunate trend where celebrities become the subject of death hoaxes. It's important to verify such news through reliable sources before believing or spreading it. Theron continues to be active in her career and personal life, making significant contributions to the entertainment industry and beyond beyond. Charlize Theron, a South African-born actress and producer, has carved out a remarkable career in Hollywood, showcasing her versatility and dedication to her craft. Born on August 7, 1975, in Benoni, South Africa, Theron has become one of the most respected and influential figures in the film industry. Theron's journey to stardom began with her breakthrough role in Two Days in the Valley 1996, but it was her performance in The Devil's Advocate 1997 alongside Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves that truly put her on the map. Her talent for inhabiting complex characters was further showcased in films like The Cider House Rules 1999 and The Italian Job 2003. In 2003, Theron delivered a career-defining performance as serial killer Aileen Warnos in Monster. Her transformation was so complete and haunting that she earned the Academy Award for Best Actress, cementing her place among Hollywood's elite. This role demonstrated her willingness to take on challenging and unconventional parts, a trait that has defined her career. Theron's filmography is diverse, ranging from action-packed roles in Mad Max Fury Road 2015 and Atomic Blonde 2017 to dramatic turns in North Country 2005 and Tully 2018. Her ability to seamlessly transition between genres is a testament to her skill and dedication. Beyond her acting prowess, Theron is also a committed producer and activist. She founded Denver and Delilah Productions, through which she has produced several critically acclaimed films, including Monster and Atomic Blonde. Her work extends beyond the silver screen. She is a vocal advocate for various social causes, including women's rights and HIV AIDS awareness. In 2007, she established the Charlize Theron Africa Outreach Project to support African youth in the fight against HIV AIDS. Charlize Theron's impact on the film industry and her contributions to social causes make her a true icon. She continues to inspire audiences worldwide with her talent 
resilience, and unwavering commitment to making a difference. Shafin Ahmed Sad news today for the world of music. Shafin Ahmed, the iconic Bangladeshi musician known for his work with the legendary band Miles, has passed away at the age of 63. He suffered a massive heart attack and was receiving treatment at a hospital in Virginia, USA. His brother, Hamin Ahmed, also a musician, confirmed the heartbreaking news to the Daily Star. Shafin Ahmed gifted us timeless hits like Herano Suk A.J. John Modin Tomar Firi Dao and Nila, unfortunately. He breathed his last far from home in the United States. Ashfaqul Bari Ruman, the lead vocalist of the band Parthibo, shared that Shafin had a concert scheduled in Virginia on July 20th. However, he fell ill before the show, leading to its cancellation and his subsequent hospitalization. Despite being put on life support as his organs began to fail, Shafin couldn't be saved. Ruman added that he spoke with Shafin's bandmate, Raisul Islam Ryman, who confirmed that Shafin had been on life support for the past two days in a Virginia hospital. Shafin Ahmed was born on February 14, 1961. Music ran in his veins, with his mother, Firoza Begum, being a legendary vocalist and his father, Kamal Desgupta, a renowned musician. Growing up in such a musically rich environment, Shafin was immersed in music from an early age, learning classical music from his father and Nazrul songs from his mother. While studying in the UK, Shafin and his elder brother Hammond were exposed to Western music, which led to the formation of Miles. This band quickly rose to become one of Bangladesh's top bands, with Shafin lending his voice to 90% of their songs and playing bass guitar, gaining widespread popularity. However, due to long-standing disputes with his brother, Shafin recently left Miles to form his own group. Among Shafin's most beloved songs are Chan Tara Sergio Jala Jala Firiao and Fiery Elena. Tributes have been pouring in from all over. Actor Zial Faruka Purba posted a photo of Shafin on social media, captioning it. A few moments ago, Bangladeshi band star Shafin Ahmed passed away at a hospital in Virginia. Ina Lilahai Wa Ina Alaihi Raji Yunwun. May Allah grant him Jenna. Musician Russell Ali expressed his disbelief, writing, May your soul rest in peace, my brother Shafin Ahmed. It feels unreal that we messaged each other just a week ago, and now you are gone. Thank you for always inspiring us with your insane talent. You will be missed. Kazi Faisal Ahmed, another musician, wrote, Inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun. Shafin Ahmed Bai is no more. The legend has left earth for eternal peace. Singer and anchor Alif Aladdin simply said, Shafin Bahai. May your soul rest in peace. John Kabir of the band Indalo added, Thanks for all the music and the memories, Shafin Bai. The music world mourns the loss of a true legend whose contributions will never be forgotten. Rest in peace, Shafin Ahmed. Yoshihiro Uchida. Ladies and gentlemen, today we remember a true legend in the world of martial arts, Yoshihiro Uchida, who passed away at the remarkable age of 104. When Yoshihiro Uchida returned to San Jose, California, after World War II, he faced a harsh reality. Employers were turning away Japanese Americans, even veterans like him. Despite this, Uchida found a job teaching judo part-time at San Jose State University while resuming his education. Uchida's first judo students were police trainees, big and often arrogant. He once shared a story about one of these young men, a war veteran, who tried to intimidate him by swinging him around violently. But Uchida, though only five foot two, waited for the right moment and struck the man's solar plexus, leaving him crumpled on the mat. Turning to his stunned students, he said calmly, Okay, fellas, this is judo. This moment was just the beginning for Uchida who went on to become a father of American Judo. Over the next 75 years, he transformed the Judo program at San Jose State University into a dominant institution, possibly becoming the winningest coach in any sport's history. Judo, which means the gentle way emphasizes using an opponent's energy and weight against them. But in 1946, many Americans misappropriated the martial art into something reckless and aggressive. Uchida worked tirelessly to establish weight classes and standards, making judo safer and more competitive. In 1953, their proposal was accepted by the Amateur Athletic Union, and Uchida organized the first collegiate championships in 1962. San Jose State dominated, 
winning 51 of the 61 National Collegiate Judo Association Championship tournaments since. In 1975, a separate women's tournament began, with San Jose State winning 24 of those. In 1964, judo was included in the Olympics, and Uchida coached the first U.S. team at the Tokyo Summer Games. His athletes, including future Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell and bronze medalist Jim Bregman, made their mark on the world stage. Yoshihiro Uchida was born on April 1, 1920, in Calexico, California, to Japanese immigrant parents. Growing up in Garden Grove, his family farmed chili peppers and other vegetables. Uchida's parents ensured their children stayed connected to their culture by studying martial arts. Uchida began learning judo at age 10. In 1940, Uchida enrolled at San Jose State University, but was drafted into the Army in 1942 after Pearl Harbor. Despite being assigned menial tasks, Uchida's knowledge of chemistry led him to be trained as a medical technician. Meanwhile, his family was forced into internment camps, a shocking and painful experience for Uchida. His life story, well known within the judo community, lent even more potency to his authority. Uchida's former students describe him as a soft-spoken, imperturbable presence who promoted discipline and tenacity in the face of adversity. In addition to his judo career, Uchida built a successful second career. After earning his degree in chemical engineering, he worked in hospital labs before purchasing a struggling medical laboratory in 1957 for $3,000. He and his wife, Ayame Haraki, expanded it into laboratory services, eventually selling it for $30 million in 1989. This success allowed Uchida to support the San Jose State Judo Club and undertake projects like revitalizing San Jose's Japantown and supporting the Japanese American National Museum. In 1986, he received the Order of the Sacred Treasure, gold rays with neck ribbon from the Emperor of Japan for his public service. Uchida's dedication to his students was unwavering. He continued overseeing judo practices at San Jose State five days a week, even well into his 90s. He emphasized that education came first, telling his athletes, I don't want stupid athletes. I want people who care about growing as a person, improving academically, and contributing to society. Uchida's influence extended beyond the mat. He helped judo students by providing jobs at his company, supporting them financially and professionally. One of his athletes, Bob Berlin, stayed with Uchida while recovering from a serious infection before the 1984 Olympics. Uchida's care helped Berland win a silver medal. Even in his final years, Uchida remained dedicated to judo. He attended his last practice just weeks before he died. His former student, Mike Swain, recalls that Uchida only started slowing down at around 100. Ladies and gentlemen, Yoshihiro Uchida's legacy will live on through the countless lives he touched and the sport he helped shape. His life was a testament to resilience, discipline, and the power of giving back. Rest in peace, Yoshihiro Uchida.